Sophie, where does the CITES system actually intersect with corruption risk and what measure was successful um, to tackle this threat? If you, could, if you could shed some light on these points, but before that, if you can just devote one minute to explain what is actually CITES, what its acronym stand for. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to be with you today. Um, CITES is the, international, is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. It regulates international trade through a system of permit and certificates with the aim of ensuring, ensuring that no species go extinct because of international trade. So the text of the convention stipulates three main conditions that must be fulfilled to, for threat to be legal, legal and authorized through the issuance of a permit. The, the specimens in trade must have been legally obtained, which means not in contradiction or in violation of any national laws for the protection of biodiversity, etc. The specimens must have been in, obtained in a sustainable fashion so that they don't have a uh, negative impact on the, on the survival of the species in the wild. And each shipment of CITES listed species must be accompanied by um, a permit or another CITES document. Um, and these permits are issued by officially designated CITES management authorities. And these things are important to understand as we discuss what are the vulnerabilities in the CITES um, trade chain. There is a lot of trade in CITES listed species over on normal years, non-pandemic years, we see over a million transactions in a year. Switzerland alone issues some 115,000 permits uh, every year, um, export permit and re-export certificates. Most countries in the world are involved in this trade. Um, CITES does not regulate trade in all species, only the 38,000 species that are included in the appendices. CITES does not entirely prohibit trade, nor does it promote trade. Uh, trade is prohibited in certain really endangered species, as you, as you probably know, um, such as the, the pangolin and, and, and others. But most species, 97% of the species regulated by trade, trade can be authorized if those conditions that I just mentioned are fulfilled. So where are the vulnerabilities um, for corruption? Um, I think it's, it's important to understand that this may occur at any point from harvest through the middlemen taking care of export over permit insurance, and finally at the point of export and import uh, controls by border or other uh, customs officials, et cetera. At each of these points, responsible gatekeepers can be susceptible to bribery, for instance, to ignore the condition for authorizing, uh, endorsing or accepting uh, a shipment of, of wildlife covered by CITES. So there, there are several points where this is a risk. I could give you a few, let me just give you a couple of examples, for instance, a permit can be issued with fraudulent information where the officer knows that the information is fraudulent because, for instance, it could be said in the permit that the specimens were bred in captivity, whereas they were not, they were taken in the wild and the conditions for trade are different depending on the origin and the, or the, the source of the, of the specimen. So, um, so that's, that's, a, that's a case we've seen in practice. There are also cases where, where the authorities have not at all verified the origin of the this, of this specimen. So they may have come from abroad, from a neighboring country, being smuggled into the country and then uh, proposed for export. Um, there have been exports and imports that have been accepted at the point of the, the control without any permits at all, just uh, against um, some, some, some payment, obviously. And then there could be other, other areas where the, of, the officer issuing the permits are well aware that the conditions haven't been met, but are issuing the permits anyway, because he's being paid to do so. There could be pressures coming from above, political pressures as well. So that's just a couple of the examples that we've seen. And, um, and in terms of measures, I think it's firstly very important to understand that the CITES community has recognized these risks and have sort of recognized them um, openly and upfront and said, we know these risks exist and therefore um, we've taken measures to try to address them. Um, some of them are sort of directly addressing uh, the corruption risks, others contribute to addressing them without actually being um, focused on, on, on the, the, without being directly targeting these risks. Um, 
as CITES is an agreement among governments, obviously the measures that are taken are addressed to governments and governments have, are um, urged to take action. But I think um, the, the, when we look at this matter and when I explain the, the, the approaches and measures taken, I think it's relevant for all stakeholders involved, including the ones we have here to understand um, and, and understand and, may, and, may, and benefit from, from these tools. So I think everybody, including NGOs and private sector transport companies have a role to play to reduce these risks. And so I'm quite happy to be able to present the, the couple of measures that have been taking the context of CITES to you. So three things that are being done to address, uh, directly address uh, corruption risks. There was the adoption of a resolution on this matter. Um, I, I, maybe we can post the link to this resolution. This was adopted already in um, 2016, and it urges parties to uh, accede to the to the convention, the UN Convention Against Corruption, and it also urged parties to um, develop anti-corruption strategies at the national level. And uh, as I said, this was adopted by COP17 in 2016. Um, and following the adoption of this resolution, UNODC, in collaboration with the CITES Secretariat, developed um, a guidance for CITES and other uh, wildlife management authorities for addressing and mitigating uh, corruption risks. And this guidance is available both in English and French and actually is a process tool. How do you actually identify within your own management authority or wildlife management authority, the risks of uh, the, the, co the vulnerabilities and, and the risk points? And then what do you do to mitigate those? And there is assistance provided both by the CITES Secretariat and other partners to actually develop such um, preventive strategies at the national level. Just for, for the indirect measures that have been taken to contribute to reducing risk. I think, first of all, um, parties are urged to adopt legislation that detailed set out the conditions for trade. So the more details you have in the national legislation, the less there is an attempt to sort of take a decision and the less vulnerable the, of, the official taking this decision is to pressures from, from above or from private sector. So we always urge um, legislation that is implementing CITES to be as precise and detailed as possible. Um, the second thing is that in, in 2019, it's like there's a year that didn't exist, 2020. In 2019, I was going to say last year, but it's, it's a year and a half ago, there was a new resolution adopted on legal acquisition findings, which basically put more emphasis on this condition that I mentioned at the beginning, that management authorities authorizing trade have to have evidence that the specimens were obtained in accordance with national laws and was not, for instance, illegally smuggled from a neighboring country. So now we're putting more emphasis on this, this condition in, in, in trade. Um, and the resolution was from that, that is addressing the, the exporting side of things, the authorizing official, but there is a matching mirroring uh, further emphasis on the importing side's responsibility to not accept anything that is written in an export permit. So if something is completely obviously not possible, the importing countries need to go back and ask for evidence of the legal acquisition or the, the sustainability finding, et cetera. So those two things are relatively new and will hopefully contribute to reducing the, the, the corruption risk. Final thing I wanted to mention was the electronic permitting systems. Um, parties are um, moving towards electronic permitting systems because inter alia for several reasons, but also because electronic permitting leads to uh, increased transparency and reduced risks of corruption because there's no paper documents, there's no signatures. It's more complicated to tamper with the information because there would be a log that can see who's been trying to tamper with the information. So not only for corruption, but including for corruption reasons, we have about a dozen countries that have already implemented the systems and we have um, some 25, 30 additional parties from all over the world. It's quite important to notice that it's, this isn't developed country, developing country divide. We have developing countries that are very far ahead, including in Sri Lanka, in putting in place e-permitting systems. And CITES Secretariat, and together with the UNCTAD, has developed a cloud-based e CITES based solution that offers a cost effective solution for permit application, processing, insurance, and reporting that is available online and, and that all parties can, can use with, with guidance from, from UNCTAD. And as I said, Sri Lanka has already implemented this system um, uh, and launched it early last year. Thank you.